In everything, he is good. The goodness of God is always uh, the praise time, the worship together is so good. It's good when the people of God get together to sing, pray, get into the Word. Go to Luke chapter number 12. As Pastor Dwayne mentioned during our praise time for a moment, we have a little uh, treat at the end of service where uh, with smiles and tears at the same time, we'll have Alex and Crystal come up and uh, let them have a word or two, and, or however Crystal, how long Crystal wants to go, maybe you, well actually you had Friday night, if there's anything you want to finish up though, you have the opportunity, but at the end of our service here, we're going to spend a little time just saying uh, we'll see you later, goodbye for a little while. Uh, the Chippies will get on the plane on Saturday, and uh, they'll be off to Lusaka and uh, the capital city of Zambia to begin again afresh. But this time, uh, two important factors. Number one, First Bible Baptist Church, you are the sending church and the supporting church of Alex and Crystal Chippy and their family. So thank you, God. That's an important, so important thing. We uh, have an opportunity to be in on something of the Lord and in the Lord, and it's out of Acts, in the book of Acts, and you think of Acts 13, and, and this is serious things. So we're in the middle of some serious things. Of course, Alex and Crystal and the girls have been here since February. Alex, uh, can't thank you enough for bringing and teaching and preaching the Word of God in the Spirit powerful word from, uh, from your heart, from God's word, from the Holy Spirit during our Bible conference. It was uh, such a, a much needed time in speaking of serious things and looking at the word of God from, uh, from the vision of God in your life. And so now here we are, April, May, in the first part of June, and here we are being uh, in a place of what I said, number one, very important, that we're the supporting church, fully supporting them in terms of sending them out, laying hands on them, and uh, sending them out. Of course, we ordained Alex. He has now an ordination in two continents, so you're double ordained, double portion. And uh, maybe that's an Elisha thing. I don't know. But uh, praise the Lord for what he has allowed us to do. Secondly, you will be, church, in a place of prayer, uh, of course, as we're sending them out in a place of giving. And I want you to know that on the online platform starting this week sometime and, and when we are able to get that going, that you'll be able to give and we are going to support them financially. We already do from our missions budget, but over and above that, they're going to need funds to live in the city of Lusaka. So First Bible Baptist Pr Church, let's do that which the Lord has led you to do. And I will look forward to having the Lord reveal that and show that, uh, again, uh, your place that you have to live in uh, costs money to live in, so does not their place in Lusaka. The costs are different, but they're still real, and uh, we need to be in a place where First Bible Baptist Church, and of course, they have some other church partners. All funds that are going to go to support them will come through First Bible. We will be uh, the church, again, that's sending them out and the church that's supporting them, and we will be supporting just as we have supported Brian and Tammy Calloway for all the years that God allowed us to send them out. And, uh, and so this is going to be really special for all of us uh, at First Bible to be in partnership with God's kingdom work, and I'm very thankful uh, that Alex and Crystal have said, yes, we'd love to be part of that, of Alex uh, as God's man to answer the call of God and and to go out out of First Bible. So we'll, at the end of service, we'll have a, a time where I'll give them a minute or two to share a word or two, and then we'll have a time of prayer, and if you want to come up and be at the altar, we'll have a few of us laying hands upon them, and we'll be praying for them. I want us to make sure that we begin well in praying for them over the next years and years as God would allow them on the field, and they know how important prayer is and how important it's been thus far 
because they are friends of our church. They're part of our church. They're church members of First Bible, and we're very, very thankful again for all that God has done through them and in them. When you look again into our text and you look up at that screen, you're reminded of, again, the theme of the Gospel of Luke. And it ties right into mission work and gospel work. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Alex believes that deeply, of course, in hearing him preach and teach the Word of God. And if you've had a chance to get a chance to know him and Crystal, they believe in that. I know Crystal spoke of the uh, importance of having someone in your life to walk alongside of you and learn the Word of God on Friday and be uh, discipled by someone and be of course, in a place where you're a willing learner, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, who's going to come alongside of me and uh, lead me to where I can really grow? Well, this is a big part of Luke's gospel. And Luke's gospel, of course, is pushing these disciples. Jesus Christ is pushing the disciples in Luke's account of, hey, I, I'm raising the bar. I'm constantly doing that. And in Luke chapter number 12, it really is... I would say just really a stewardship chapter. And as we've looked at uh, really the stewarding of the Word of God, stewarding of the gospel, the stewarding of the resources and all that Jesus is doing, again, it ties into mission work. You see, the Son of God, the Son of Man, he spoke multiple times about the kingdom of God the spirit things, not just the physical things. And sometimes we go to the physical things and we're drawn to them because we can see them. And being a steward means you have to take care of those physical things, but they're spiritual things. So the questions mount. What do we seek after? Who do we seek after? Where is our heart focused? Last week we spoke about being caught up in things. And it says in Luke Chapter 12, verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a really powerful statement, the kingdom of God, as, as Luke's gospel records uh, more than any other place, Jesus Christ mentions the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. Fear not, little flock, it says in verse 32, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It says in verse 34 there, as well as we lead in, to verse number 35 in our text for today, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It is a matter of the heart. And you know the old phrase, um, at the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And this is the kingdom of God work that Jesus Christ is calling these disciples to in a deeper way. He's at the end of his earthly ministry, very close, I, 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 forgive me, not he's at the end, but he's getting close to the end of his earthly ministry. And he's showing them that eternal stewardship is paramount to Jesus Christ and to these disciples. Even consider this with this parable of the rich fool, which is found in chapter number 12, and we looked at that last week. That that rich fool, in his parable about him, revealed a great subject. And that great subject is God's provision and what you have belongs back to him not for you to keep it and use it for yourself. It is, again, an eternal matter. We always need, I guess, to be honest and check our hearts when it comes to our possessions because our life truly is not measured in the things that we have. Though we have to, again, care for them. It is measured in our heart in the matter our walk with the Lord. You see, this life, and I want to use this term today, and we've kind of had it as part of our messages in chapter number 12. I entitled our message today, Brevity of This Life, because the word brevity means shortness, brief. And it really does, when you look it up in two or three different places, it applies to time. Brevity, the brevity of this life. May the brevity of this life that Jesus Christ is speaking through here from verses 35 down through 59. We're going to cover all these verses. I'm just going to outline the chapter. We're not going to camp out on one place really a long time. Sometimes we'll take 10 verses and really get into it. Today I just want to outline these 20-ish verses and see really what God would have us 
to grasp as we look at the brevity of this life. You see, as a steward, a lot of things can inspire you. Well, again, I can get more. Well, again, God will be pleased with me so I can look at, again, the physical and the spiritual. As a steward, I can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to live forever, and I'm going to be making money and doing stuff forever. I'm going to stay young. I'm going to stay strong, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do for my whole life until I get to be 85 and then fall asleep, and I'll wake up in the presence of the Lord. Has everybody got that figured out like that? Is that good? But then 60 hits. So those of you in your 20s, enjoy. Teenagers, yeah. But the idea about brevity of this life is the gospel life, the kingdom of God life. It was funny that you said that this morning, Big Mac, to me. In a moment of time, your daughter, a few years back, when we had a baseball clinic, yes, I, I pray to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. It was Caitlin, wasn't it? That's got to be 14, 13 years ago. In the brevity of life, you think, wow. What will I do with the life that you've given me in Jesus? Well, that's what Jesus is doing with these disciples today. He's saying, you have a life in me, and I'm going to speak to you about some parables, and I'm going to speak to you about some timing of what's going on in my time with you specifically there. And then as we draw that, we look today and go, how does this hit me? If I was one of those disciples sitting in front of Jesus Christ, what would I do with these incredibly strong words that Jesus is speaking about how we steward our things that are eternal? Let's read Scripture. We've got a little bit of work to do. Stay with me. I'm not going to stop off too often. We'll get right through this passage. And then I just want to show you, again, an outline, four different pieces of these verses. But they're good, so just... Take a minute, it's good sometimes just to read some scripture. Here we go, verse number 35, down through the end of the chapter. It says there, let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Consider Jesus has just spoken a little bit about where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. You have this life that you've been given. How are you going to steward it? He's speaking really to those disciples, the ones closest to him. What are you going to do with all that I've given you? You know the phrase. We, we've used it often, again, especially in this chapter. He says in verse number 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself... Make them sit, to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. That is an incredible picture. Because consider that those servants are supposed to care for the steward, the Lord of the home. When he comes home after his wedding celebration, he's bringing home his wife. But yet it says here, blessed are those servants because the Lord, when he comes home, is going to take care of them. Kind of. Sounds a little bit like Jesus himself washing the feet of the disciples, doesn't it? Incredible, neat parable here. And if you shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants, because that means the servants have been prepared. They go with the lights, they get their loins where they're supposed to be, and by the way, and their loins are pulling them up and tucking them under so they can move quickly, their undergarments, they tuck them up underneath, that belt, that rope that holds them up so they can move quickly when the Lord comes for them. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Does anybody know about a thief that's been really successful and also announce when he's coming to break into your house. What a great illustration, by the way. A thief doesn't tell you because they want to be successful in seeing 
how they can grab you. So Jesus Christ, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but simply put in this parable, he's saying, hey, you ought to be ready. You ought to be watching. Because at any time, he could come home. Verse 41. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And the Lord said, and the Lord answers beautifully here. You know who I'm talking to? Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household and to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. He's speaking to the faithful stewards. He's speaking to the disciples. Clearly that's who he's talking to. I'm talking to those that are serious, that are truly in and see the brevity of life. I'm talking to them. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath, but, verse number 45, and if that servant say in his heart, he, he's given him rule, he's given him caretaking, he, he is the steward now over all, I've given him more responsibilities, my Lord delayeth his coming. The Lord's going to give him all this stuff, the Lord's going to take good care of him, but I delay my coming. Then this servant that he's going to give him charge over all these things shall begin to beat the men's servants and maid, maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken? The Lord of that servant will come in the day when he looketh not for him, and at that hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Very simply, he's not going to lose salvation if he is a believer and a follower. What he's going to do is say, hey, I'm serious about my judgment. I'm not going to give you what I said I was going to give you. You're going to have an eternal life, but your stewardship of what you had, would have, you're not going to get it. Because it says in verse 47, that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. God is serious about the loss of things that we could have if we would just be good stewards, faithful servants. Verse 48, some of you I'm sure have memorized parts of this verse, to whom much is given, much is required, is maybe the way you would say it. It says in verse 48, but he that knew not and did commit these things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will, be at, will ask the more responsibilities. Verse 49, and I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. That baptism with John the Baptist was the beginning of the forerunner of the baptism that he's going to have in this cross and his resurrection. He says, I, how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Well, I have to accomplish this, that cup that cannot be passed from me. The baptism into death and then the resurrection in life. Verse 51, so suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. But the division is spiritual division. It's the believer versus the non-believer. It's, they're going to be at odds. He says, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter-in-law. Oh, excuse me, I skipped it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean that, by the way. The daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her. By the way, why, why is it the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got that. But that's a real thing. Because in the family, if there's redeemed versus unredeemed, believers versus unbelievers, there's going to be a division. Verse 54. And he said also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there come a shower, and so it is. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, there will be heat, and it come to pass. You know about the weather. You know about what's going on and the seasons. But what does he say in verse 56? Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? <clears throat> Yea, 
And why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? And when thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. Even in that last part, he's saying, resolve the matter from the magistrate to the, before it has to go to the judge. Judge before it has to go to the officer because if you can resolve the matter, then you will not be in a place where you'll go to prison. What is Jesus saying in pulling all this together in the different parables? He's very simply saying this. Disciples, I'm serious about what you have in me. And I would love for you to capture, and as we're reading, we need to capture that we have all of these matters before us to deal with in real life. Don't let them pull us down. You see, Jesus Christ had an approach. And when the disciples heard the teaching from their master and it pivoted, it was usually to grab their attention. What about a coming judgment? What about the account of our lives? What about the need to be properly prepared as his steward? You see, Jesus' teaching of the disciples, it continued. It kept on going. But as he did shift into this place, he said, look, I know you're anxious about all that's going to happen to me, but I would rather take your anxiousness down when it comes to eternal matters because I want you to be focused not about this life, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. I know that you have to steward the things of this world and things of this life, but I want you to put down your anxiousness about the material things and be ready for the Son of Man and the work he's going to do at the cross and the resurrection and his reappearance, but also, too, that he's going to come again. And he says, I will come again shortly. I'm going to come. And these disciples are saying, hey, I guess you really have our attention. What Peter said is good. In fact, there can be some negative connotation to that, but I think, hey, he asks a good question. A good question is, hey, who are you talking to with these parables? Who is this parable for? It's for those that are faithful and wise stewards whom the Lord has made ruler over his household. It's a pretty powerful, convicting statement for those disciples there and for us today. Has the Lord given us much to be accountable for each day? I would say so, in your salvation. Just as the disciples who heard his parables, I ask you what reproof hits us by the Holy Spirit when Jesus' words point out something very simply found in verse number 48. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. Let me reiterate the title of the message before I just go through these simple little lesson points as an outline of these verses. Brevity of this life. Can you grab that and put that in perspective right here? That the physical life that we have is brief and it is measured by time. And you and I would love to be able to say we've done all that we could for the Lord or hey, it doesn't have to be, hey, I've done all that I could do, but rather, I've done that which the Lord has asked me as many times as I could. And I realized that he wanted me to be at a place of watching. He wanted me to a place of alert. He wanted me to be at a place where, hey, I'm going to wait on him. I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to do all that he wants me to do. Again, four simple things. First one, readiness is important. The readiness is for us. What do you mean by readiness? Well, the brevity of life confronts dedicated disciples to be on point. I use that phrase sometimes. We've got to be on point. Always prepared to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We always have to be on point. I was joking with someone last week. Someone in the audience will know who I'm talking about. And I said, hey, every day's a Super Bowl. What does that mean? You'll figure it out. 
One day that person will figure it out. Because the brevity of this life confronts dedicated disciples to be on point, always prepared to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Go over there to Luke, excuse me, Mark chapter number 13 real quick. I just, for time, I'm just going to highlight this a little bit, but you can study it out. This is similar context to the passage that we're reading. Mark 13, verse 33, pick it up in verse 32. But of that day, that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So here is, of course, Jesus Christ speaking after he's had the parable of the fig tree before them. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Think about the whole acts of the apostles is him giving them in the far off journey after he, who left his house. Here's the authority. Do the work that I've called you to do. Acts 1.8. It's all there. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the matter, master of the house cometh or at evening or midnight or at cock crowing or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch. There's a whole, whole breakdown. You like W words? There you go. Watch, wait, work. I know Bobby would like that a lot. There you go. We all like that stuff. That's good preaching stuff right there. You go to Mark 14. For time, understand this. You know what the context now is. That in real time, at, uh, Mark 14, he just gave a parable, just gave a, a look-see into the future of Son of Man, going to the cross and then leaving the work, and then saying, I'll be back, right? Watch, watch, pray, watch. Well, here's in real time. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he do? He's asking them to watch and pray. So, steward-wise, I want you to steward the future of these spiritually eternal things. But I want you to steward what I'm giving you right now in the moment. Because it says in verse number 34... He says to them, my soul is seating sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. Verse 35, he went forward a little. He fell on the ground. He prayed that it was possible. The hour might pass from him. God's not going to have that cup pass from him. He's going to have to face this baptism. This is the judgment that he is going to face. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not will, what I will, but thou what thou wilt, he cometh, he findeth them sleeping. In verse 37, saying to Peter, Simon, couldst thou not watch one hour? Verse 38, watch ye and pray. Readiness is important to the Lord. Readiness is important for us as stewards of this eternal stewardship we have. And as it says there, once again, it says there in verse number 40 on the slide up there, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. As you see in Luke, number, Luke chapter number 12, Jesus is putting all that he can before them about stewardship. The second one, commitment. Commitment is important. Commitment is important if I'm going to see what it means to steward, and if I look at things through the brevity of life, then maybe I will get a little bit more serious a little bit quicker. Readiness is important. Commitment is important. The first two are for these dedicated disciples. The second two, to me, are for the non-believer. The brevity of, li of this life confronts dedicated disciples to be on call, as a nurse would be on call, as a doctor would be on call, as someone who's in service would be on call, as a steward who works his, her, his or her responsibilities. You all have responsibilities. I have responsibilities. We have responsibilities spiritually. And a lot of them are tied together to every one of us having the same responsibility to ask God to make us to be more like Jesus Christ, to be spirit-filled, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God, to know the will of God and live it out as very best as we can, to be led by the word, to be in prayer, to watch and to pray. Commitment is important. It's part of this idea that we would be faithful servants and not unfaithful servants. We would steward well. Go back to Luke chapter number two. You say, why in the world would you go back there? Well, 
the phrase that's in here makes it clear that Jesus Christ and his whole life was a very incredible, amazing example of who this servant is that says, hey, I've got this responsibility. I'm the dedicated son of man and the son of God, and I'm committed to steward the work that my father gave me. So, Luke chapter number 2, what is Jesus Christ doing? Well, of course we know in verse 41, 42, they've gone to Jerusalem for the custom of the feasts. Jesus Christ stays back, as the scripture tells us. Joseph and, and, and Mary have not figured it out till afterwards. And we go down a little bit further in verse number 46 and pick it up there. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. <laughs> Jesus Christ, he's dedicated, he's committed, he's the steward of the things that his father has given him to do at 12 years old. It says they all heard him and were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? You know the passage, many of you. Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Here's the words that are so important. And he said unto them, How is it that, thou, that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Jesus Christ is the example of seeing that commitment is important. And you can use that terminology to interchange in many places. But when he shows us in these parables, in this time with the disciples of saying, look, in Luke chapter number 12, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and you, you just say, I'm going to abdicate my responsibilities. I'm not going to be on call. I'm not going to do what God would have me to do. I'm not going to wait patiently on his direction. Then the Lord of that servant will lose out on the reward that the Lord would have had for him. And that shows an unfaithful servant. But as it says on verse number 48 up on the screen, it's about a commitment. He that had knew not and did commit these things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Jesus Christ was committed all. Again, back when he was 12 years old, he's fulfilling that. What am I fulfilling? I've been saved for over 40 years. What am I doing with what God has given me? Am I being faithful? Am I being, re do I have readiness? Am I committed? Are we looking at the spiritual aspect of things more than the physical? It continues to dovetail and come together with all 59 verses of chapter number 12. It's so mighty and so powerful because it is about eternal things. The third piece. Division is important. We see where in the first two, readiness and commitment, they talk about, to me, directly for those dedicated disciples. But verse 49 through 53, I think it could go both ways, but here's where God put me on this. The brevity of this life forces non-believers to be convicted over Christ's judgment through the cross and resurrection. Someone has to get to the place where they're lost before they'll get saved. Is there any argument on that? No. You have to understand that you're going to either pay the price for your sin or you're going to accept the free gift of salvation through the costly sacrifice of Jesus Christ judging the sin. So what would you do? You're a non-believer and you're saying, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't care. I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. I am a pagan. I don't believe. Well, very simply, Jesus Christ is saying in this illustration, in this parable, hey, I know why I've come. I sent fire on the earth. And what will I have be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? How much does an unbeliever have to hear about what Jesus Christ has done 
to take the whole world's sin on the cross, to be punished and beaten for his blood to be shed, to be buried, and then hallelujah, be rose on the third day. The believer, unbeliever has to get to a point where they're truly convicted over Christ's judgment. He's judging everything in sin, all that mankind has done through the cross and the resurrection. Because God requires the payment. God judges everything. And what happens in that judgment is it brings division. Go to John chapter number 9. I won't cover them both for time. John 9. These blind Pharisees, it's like any religious person today. I don't have any sin that's that deep. Oh, I have sin. I kind of have some sin. Oh, I don't know. I guess the sin maybe is okay with God because he's so good and loving. No, God says, hey, as Jesus said, I send fire on the earth. Purification, judgment, the cross. The father will be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter. Why? Because God has to clearly draw the line. And Jesus is the drawing point of that line. Division is important. It says in verse number 39 of chapter 9 in John's gospel, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind to see the need, to see the need. Verse 40, and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? Great answer. Verse 41, Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. To be confronted with the reality as Jesus Christ is saying to his disciples, and to make sure that they know that in the opposition and the division of those that are not believers in Jesus Christ, I want you to know, disciples, that the, the, the non-believers must grasp their need for salvation because Christ's judgment through the cross and the resurrection is the only payment for their sins. You cannot, again, get someone to a place where they believe in Jesus Christ until they believe that they need a Savior, that they need someone that paid the price for sin. I just want a different life. I just want to change life. I just want to have recovery. I just want to be better. I just uh, just, just pray a prayer. No, no, no. Just understand that I'm going to turn from the way that I have gone to pay for my sin, and I'm no longer going to be in a place where (laughs) I'm trusting me. I'm trusting the cross. I'm trusting the resurrection. And hallelujah, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you call on the name of the Lord to save you, you have eternal life. You now are part of God's kingdom work. You now have a new life in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that judgment that was upon their blindness is completely turned around when he gives them eyes to see through their conversion and redemption. The Pharisees said, no, no, no. The division's clear, is what Jesus is saying. There is a division. The division is between the non-believer and the unbeliever. It says in verse number 52, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. What an awful setting that can be. And if you have people in your home, I mean your generational family, and they're lost, there is truly a division. And it's rough. And it's hard. And when you bring up things about Jesus Christ and they tell you, I don't need that. 
they haven't even got to the place <laughs> where they can get beyond the division. But division is important to Jesus Christ. And lastly, discernment. Discernment is really important to Jesus Christ. The discernment is acting upon the realization that you are divided against Christ. Discernment. Brevity of this life forces non-believers to consider the time of righteous self-judgment. Jesus is righteous self-judgment. For repentance is now. Not self-righteous blindness against sin. But rather, consider the time of righteous self-judgment for repentance is now. You know the scripture verses that start coming to you. Today is day. It's a day of salvation. Why would you want to wait to get saved? If you're lost today and you're not a believer, why would you want to keep on going? You've got to a place where you're divided against Christ. It's clear that you're not a believer. But your heart is being softened by God's work through your friends, through the word of God, through the gospel. You've considered yourself being just an infidel, a skeptic, maybe just a heathen and a doubter. And you say, you know what? I'm at this point where I need to use some discernment. If Jesus Christ paid the price for me, and the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God and raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's pretty good stuff right there. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is a division and there is opposition. The two sides, they, they can have friendship or relationship, but there's coming a point in time there is a spiritual division. And then that person who's the non-believer must go, wait a minute, the righteous self-judgment, me being viewed in God's eyes through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, there's none righteous, no, not one. As Romans 4 teaches us, hey, Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness before God. He was made righteous by faith. I had the self-judgment upon my own life. Go to Luke chapter number 11. You just go a page or two away. We just preached about this a little bit ago. Think of what Jesus Christ said to them when he brought up to this evil generation, this nation of Israel, these Jews, and said, hey, do you realize you as an evil generation, you miss Jonah? Verse 29, chapter number 11. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. And as for Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. You got Jonah, and that was incredible. But, but I'm here before you. I'm the Son of Man. I'm divinity. It says in verse 31, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. There's a division there. For she came from the innermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Jesus' message is better and greater and re for repentance than Jonah. Verse 32. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Those people back there received the repentant message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they repented. And they're here, as he's saying, hey, Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment of this generation and shall condemn it, because you know what? You rejected Jesus. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. That's Jesus Christ. You ought to be a little bit more discerning, non-believer. You must get to the place where you know that you're in a divisive place, a dis divisive, non-believing place, I don't believe, and say, wait a minute, now I'm getting some of that conviction. My eyes are being opened up. I need Jesus Christ as Savior. Okay. Then don't be like the Israelites, the hypocrites. It says in verse number 56, again, he discerned the face of the sky and the earth. But how is it that ye do not discern this time? 
this moment, this situation, this place where the Son of Man is going to the cross, and then this, the Son of Man, is going to return. You hypocrites, you discern the weather. It's funny when you think about how important the weather is to us with all kinds of apps. And that may be the first topic of conversation. The lost person will divert attention away from their place of need for Jesus Christ, but they can discern the face of the sky and of the earth and tell you, hey, we know what season it is. It's fall, winter, spring, but you cannot discern the time, this spiritual time. Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? You're going to end up going before the judge, Jesus, and you're going to end up in prison, eternal prison, and separation from God all of your life, eternal wise, and you're going to say, why did I not call on Jesus to save me? At the end of our message, we always like to have a time of prayer, a place of where you get things going with the Lord. I put up on the screen this for today. Does the brevity of life even register for people? I don't know. You say, oh, you got to get old and have heart problems and blood pressure issues and diabetes. and Your life is brief. Our life is brief. The brevity of our life. As we seek ye the kingdom of God, what causes us to ask questions of people about serious things? Am I a steward of those things? Are you a steward of those things? Are you a steward of what God has given you? Do you live daily prepared to serve and to give an account of your life unto the Lord? This is about eternal stewardship. Would you please stand for a time of prayer together? We'll just take a couple of minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Debbie, would you please play some background music? Why don't you bow your heads for a moment? Maybe you're a non-believer and you're sorting through discernment. Maybe the division side of things. Maybe you're a believer today, one of those dedicated disciples, and you're saying, wow, Whew. commitment, ooh, so important. Readiness, I need to be ready. Father in heaven, in this time of prayer, we, we just want to take a brief time to really be confronted with the question that we have here. It's a serious question is, do you live daily? Do I live daily? Do we live daily prepared to serve and to give an account of our lives unto the Lord? Father, work in our hearts in this time of prayer. This is really an important view for us in the brevity of this life. God, find us to be faithful stewards, we pray in Jesus' name.